Okay, so we're uh, on lecture four, the essence of the problem. So before we discussed how uh, mankind was a blessed being, mankind truly knew everything, uh, to truly had all blessings of God, but the most important blessing was to have communion with God. Mm -hmm. And in just one instant, in just one occurrence, he lost everything. He uh, became a dead being when before he was alive, before he was a kingly being, now he's a slave, and before he was a child of God, but now he is a child of the devil, and now he's separated from God. And because he's separated from God, all the problems come. All our thoughts are evil, our heart is evil, the economic problems, family problems, health problems, environmental problems, problems with children, all of these come because we're separated from God. All of these come because we have broken the covenant, and breaking the covenant results in us being separated from God. So we must look at this from this, uh, this perspective. In Genesis 1, all the chapter, we can see there are cer certain principles of creation. Why did God give us Genesis 1? It was not so that we may know simply how fish are made or how the trees are made, but it's, it's all about mankind. God describes fish, describes the uh, trees because of mankind. Just like God made water first and then he made fish being them and just like that the fish don't have any problem. They were made to be in water and when they are, they are in the water they're happy, they're, they don't have any problem, they swim, fr uh, swim freely and also uh, that's the same for the trees. Trees, when they're planted, rooted in the ground, then they have no problems. They're, the trees are happy, they have no other source of concern. Then, what about us? What about men? What about people? Mm. When we are with God, it's the same. We're happy, we're free, we have no source of concern when we are with God. And that is the immutable rule. This is a principle of creation. This is a rule of God. When we are with God, then we can be happy, we can be free, and we can be normal. When we're not with God, then everything falls apart. The same, just like a fish that is taken out of the water struggles and dies, just like a tree that is uprooted later, uh, even if you give it water, it will not work. Even if it has sunlight, it, would not, it will not work. It will just dry up. It will just perish. The same way, like us, if we're separated from God, even though we have many good things, even though we may have knowledge, philosophy, and good deeds, many ethical works, a good family, we will die and struggle because we're separated from God. So this is a principle that God made. Genesis 2, 7 illustrates this. Uh, we saw this before, but when God made man, he was not a, a life being first. He, he was not alive when he was just made from the dust. But when God's spirit or God's breath came upon this uh, being of made of dust, then he was a living being. Then he truly lived. So God must be with man in order for us to be alive. That is what it means to be a spiritual being. Just like fish must be in the water, we must be with God. That is what, that is what it means to be a spiritual being. So mankind's only problem is to be separated from God. All suffering and death come from the moment being separated from God. From the moment we're separated from God, all problems start. All uh, issues start. So we now know that what separation from God is. We know all the problems that come from being separated from God. We know the consequence of being separated from God. But why are we separated from God? We must know this. We were made to be with God. We are designed to be with God. Why are we separated then from God? This is something we must know. And uh, let us look at Isaiah chapter 59 in order to know this. Isaiah 59. Chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Here we see the effect of sin. 
Many times in church when we say sin, uh, we usually talk about sexual immorality, we talk about drinking, smoking, gambling, uh, immoral things, hating your brother, or uh, some even uh, bring this to an extreme uh, and say sin uh, is, is an ethical and moral aspect. Of course, we must not be ethically or morally wrong and the Bible tells us not to do those things but the sin that the God uh, that the Bible is describing here is something deeper it's something that causes separation from God sin is so grave sin is something so dire that it causes us to be separated from God think about this this way God is all-powerful God can do everything God has the the world in his control and God wants to be with his children God wants to be with his people but sin blocks him sin blocks him from being with us think about that sin is so dire sin is something so severe that God cannot be with us because of sin this is the effect of sin what was sin in the original man's case remember when God had told them not to eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, then Eve said, yes, of course, we will not eat, we must not touch it, or then we will, not, uh, we will die. But then she saw the fruit, and she, she saw the fruit seemed very good. It seemed delicious. It seemed very good for attaining wisdom. And then she ate of that fruit. Sin, the sin here was not eating uh, the, the fruit itself was not the root of the sin. The fruit was not magical or poisonous. It was not the eating of the fruit that was the sin itself, but rather the disobeying of God's word. Eating the fruit meant disobeying God's word. It meant breaking the covenant with God. That is sin. Denying God's word. Because denying God's word is denying God himself. God is the word. And when we deny the word, when we break the word of the covenant, then we're breaking our bond with God. And that is the root of sin. If we look at Genesis uh, 3, 6, we can see a little bit about how this happened. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and ate it. Here we can see that not only was it Eve who was deceived, or not only the woman, but her husband, and he was watching. Here, uh, we before we said that um, that unbelief and, and being incredulous or, or uh, being uh, unbelieving and also being ignorant was the cause of sin, ignorance and unbelief. In the case of Eve, if we look at um, verse 3, Genesis 3.3, 3, the serpent comes and uh, in verse 2, he asks, uh, uh, pardon, in verse 1, it says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman responds. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Okay, keep this in mind. Verse 3, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Remember, Genesis uh, 2.17, God had directly said to Adam, you must, uh, you will, um, let us look at it again. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But you must not eat from a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now we see Eve, Eve's answer in verse 3. She says, You must not eat uh, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Do we see a difference here? There's a slight difference here. God had told them, you must not eat of this fruit because when you eat it, the day you eat, you will certainly die. But Eve is saying here, if uh, we must not eat it or we, and we must not touch it, God never said anything about touching, but she said, we must not touch it. So Eve had an idea of what the word of God was. She kind of knew. She had a vague idea, a very similar idea, but not the true word of God. 
So she added something unto the word of God. And if uh, we see the last part, or, or you will die, here in the original, uh, it removes one of the uh, parts when God has said, you will die, die, but Eve only says it once. So she didn't know the severity of the, of the consequences that this would cause. So she took something away from the word, she added something to the word. And we know what the Bible says about that. She says, uh, the Bible says, if you add anything to this scroll of Revelation, to this word of Revelation, then the plagues that are in the Bible will also be added to you. And if you take something away from the word, then your participation from the book of life will also be taken away. So the word of God is so absolute. The word of God must be so precise and even though Eve had a good idea of what the Word of God was, she mixed something in. Now her gospel was corrupted. Now her gospel was not accurate. <coughs> then what happened? Satan knows when our gospel is not accurate. Satan knows when the word we are holding on to is not accurate. And he says, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, now he's lying completely. Now he is saying the complete opposite of the word of God. You will not certainly die for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. Now let's ask this question. Adam and Eve, were they not like God? Were they different from God? No, the psalmist says they were a little bit less than God. God says, you are my image. Yet, the serpent is telling them, you're not like God. You will be like God when you sin, but you're now not like God. And he, will say, and he said, you will know good and evil. What is good and evil? The true definition of good and evil, not a moral standard, because every country has different ideas of what is good, what is bad, but not a, in a cultural way, what is good and evil for God. For God, the good was keeping the covenant. Keeping the word of God was good. Violating the word of God, breaking the word of God was evil. So Adam and, and, and the woman, they knew what was good and evil. They knew that they had to hold on to the covenant. They knew that breaking the covenant will cause them to surely die. They knew that. They knew good and evil. But Satan is telling them, you will know after you sin. So Satan is a father of lies. <clears throat> Satan deceived them completely. And then what happened to the woman? She, was, she did not know the word of God exactly. So in verse 6 it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of a tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Here we, we can see the reason why the woman ate. She saw the fruit, she considered, she weighed Satan's argument against God's argument and said, maybe this fruit can be good, maybe I can do this, because she did not, she did not know the gospel exactly, the, the covenant exactly. What about Adam? Where was he when all of this was happening? He was with her. And he saw all of this, he heard of all of this. And um, the woman did not hear the covenant directly from God. She, she did not hear these words directly from God. Only Adam was there, right? Then uh, God made Adam sleep and, and took out a rib and made, uh, made the woman. So surely, uh, maybe God told her later or maybe Adam told her what God said. But, but Adam knew this covenant. Adam had heard it directly. Adam knew this, these short words, but he knew them. God had told them directly. Yet... He was watching. He was watching how his wife sinned and he did nothing about it. He could have said, woman, remember the covenant. We must believe in the word of God. We will surely die if we eat of this. Yet he observed. What was Adam's problem? What was Adam's fall? He considered God's word. He considered the serpent's word. He knew God's words, words very exactly, but he did not believe in them. He did not believe in the covenant of God. How can we know this? If he had believed this word, he would have obeyed this word. He would have told the woman something. Let's not eat it. Let's obey God. The God's word is absolute. We must obey God. But he did nothing. He just watched. Maybe he thought, if she eats and dies, then I will not eat. 
But if she eats and does not die, then maybe I'll give it a try. He was testing God's word. He was testing the validity of God's word. He was comparing truly what will happen uh, if I hold on to this word and what will not. And what happened? The woman did not die. To his eyes, he did not die. she did not die. Maybe they should have waited or something, but she did not die. And Adam saw this. Adam saw the reality of the word of God not taking place to his eyes. He said he was keeping in mind the covenant of God is you will surely die, but my wife ate and she did not die. Then there was conflict, reality versus the truth of the word. Mm -hmm. And Adam had to choose. Will I believe or will I believe according to this reality I see? Will I believe the word of God or this reality? And he chose reality. He chose the word of Satan. Adam failed because of unbelief. Eve, because she did not know. Adam, because he did not believe. Both, in the end, sinned. Because they denied the word of God. And if we see Romans chapter 5, verse 19, we can see the consequence of this sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 19, tells us, <clears throat> For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. So here it tells us, through the disobedience of one man. So God is very strict and very clear in revealing that this was disobedience that killed mankind. Sin was disobedience. Disobeying the word was sin itself. Through this verse, we can see that through all of this, through this, mankind died because he disobeyed the covenant of God. Not just any uh, rule of do this or do that, but the covenant of God was broken. And Romans 5.12 tells us, Sin entered the world, world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. Romans 5.12 tells us that sin entered the world through one man, through Adam, and death entered to sin, through sin. So here the Bible is telling us that sin causes death. Sin causes to be separated from God. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 tells us, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam, in the state of Adam, all die. This is sin. Sin is death. Sin is not simply uh, something that will be punished by God. Sin is not something that, oh, I made a mistake and then God will punish me. Or it's not something like that in the Bible. Sin is death. But what is sin? Sin is denying the word of God. The sin is violating God's covenant, breaking God's covenant. And as we saw in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me put it this way. Sin is, exists in us. The psalmist said, my mother conceived me in sin. So, so sin is related to us constantly and this is something that produces death. Even Jesus. Remember when Jesus was crucified, when he was taking all of the sin of the world before he had said, the Father and I are one, the Father is always with me. He said, the, my I and God are in constant communication, right? Jesus said that. But when he bore the cross, when Jesus was upon the cross, what did he say? Do you remember? He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Jesus that said, I am one with the Father at this time said, I am no longer one with the Father. God, why did you abandon me? Why? Because at that time, he had the sin of the world upon his shoulders. When sin entered, even Jesus, he was separated from the Father, just that one moment. So in us, that sin separates us from God. And the sin is to have broken the covenant. Disobeying the covenant is the sin. Okay, so now we know the um, gravity or the severeness of the severity, pardon, of this sin. Then, who caused the sin? Why did we sin? We're made to be with God. Why did we sin? There was an, another element here in play. 
First John chapter three, verse eight, please. First John uh, chapter three, verse eight tells us the word of God says, "The one who does what is sinful is of the devil." Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So here in the first part, it tells us the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So here it establishes a clear connection. Sin is always connected to the devil. It's not something that can just happen randomly. The devil is the one who causes sin, who instigates sin upon the lives of people. So if we sin, if there is sin, then it is always connected with the devil, with Satan. Who is Satan? We must know our adversary. We must know Satan clearly in order for us to know the covenant clearly. We must know him according to the Bible. If we look at the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 to 19, it says, Ezekiel 28, uh, 12 to 19, it says, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, uh, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. So you were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked uh, you walked among the fire stones. You were blameless in your ways from the days you were created till wickedness was found in you. Mm -hmm. So this is the description that the Bible gives us of Satan. Here, God says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is how Satan is described before his fall. He was perfect. He was full of wisdom. He was perfect in beauty. All types of precious stones adorned him and his mountings were made of gold. He was a garden cherub and he was in the holy mount of God. He was a being that constantly saw God and he was blameless until the day there was wickedness found in him. So here we see certain descriptions. He was perfect. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was a seal of perfection. So Satan was not just a simple evil spirit. He's not just simply a being that is, is it, it tries to uh, give us problems. It, Satan is not just like that, but here it says he was a, an angel of God, a cherub of God, of the highest order. In Isaiah 14, um, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, tells a little bit more about this angel. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit and throne on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights on Mount Zavon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So we see what wickedness was found in him. He wanted to ascend like the most high. He wanted to be like God. Even though he was already a great being, he said, I can be like God. I I can be sit like him who is in the most high. I can make my assembly in the heavenly mounts. Even he was perfect. He was uh, full of wisdom. He had many things that are truly tremendous. So, but he wanted to be like God. He wanted to take the place of God. So what happened? A great battle arose. If we see in the book of Revelations chapter 12, we can see this great battle taking place. Revelations chapter 12. Um, We'll see some key verses um, in the, from verse 7, uh, Revelations 12, 7. It tells us, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and Satan, the, and the dragon and his angels 
fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. So here we can see a little bit about the battle that broke out and Michael, God didn't even deal with him. Michael was sent to battle with him and it, here it says, here it says the dragon, who is Satan, and his angels. Dragon, uh, the dragon and his angels. Why did he have angels? Why was it not only him? Um, here we see in, uh, in verse 4, Revelation 12.4, uh, it says, Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So here it is talking about how Satan brought a third part of all the angels to his side. One third part of his angels believed in Satan. And let me put it this way. Remember um, in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah sees the glory of God and he sees all the seraphs and he sees them chanting, holy, 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 and the glory is ascending, the glory is going up high, and the angels, Jesus himself says, these angels, the angels see my father's, see my father's faith, uh, face every, every day. The angels are spiritual beings also. The angels also have uh, also look at God. They know the glory of God. Perhaps we do not know the, the presence of God fully, but the angels do. Angels are spiritual beings who meet with God day by day. And these angels, a third part of these angels saw Satan and thought, maybe if I go with Satan, maybe I can beat God. Maybe I can defeat God, even though they see the glory of God and this glory of God that is ascending constantly, even though they know what the presence of God means, they said, maybe Satan is stronger. So that is how powerful Satan was. He convinced a third part of the angels to come with him to rebel against God. That is how great Satan was as a being. So. He fought with Michael and of course he lost. He lost and was thrown down to this earth and now he is ruling over all the earth. This is what the Bible describes. The great dragon, the ancient serpent, the serpent at the beginning, it says this is Satan or the devil. If we look at Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, it says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Here it talks about a ruler of the kingdom of the air. Mm -hmm. And it says, you follow the ways of this world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air is Satan. Satan holds dominion over the ways of the world. And what is the air? It's not simply the physical air we perceive, but rather the space between God and us, between God and the world. That space, that air is ruled by Satan. According to the Bible, according to Paul, he says Satan holds dominion over the world. He holds dominion over this space that is between you and God. And then what does he do? He leads you into the ways of the world. So the world has a master and it's Satan at this moment. So Satan is ruling over the world. Before we saw how he was the seal of perfection. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But this was not lost when he came to this earth. When he, he, when he was cast out of, of heaven, he did not lose all of his abilities. He is still a very cunning being. He's a very powerful being still, and he's deceiving all of the world. He is bringing all of the world into his ways. This is what the Bible tells us about this. In John 8, 44, we saw, we saw it before. He is the father of lies and all of the world right now are his children. People are children of Satan right now, and he's the deceiver. He has spoken lies from the beginning. First John 5:19. 
tells us the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5.19 tells us this. He is a rebel against God and he is a divider because he divides us from God. This is the role Satan is taking upon. So Satan is a being of great power who now holds dominion over the world. If we look at John uh, 12, 31, if we, and John 16, 11, we can see that the Bible describes him as the prince of this world, as the uh, ruler or as a, uh, as a being over all the world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it tells us he is the God of, of this age. So he is the prince of the world and the God of, his age, of this age. He has usurped the place that truly God must have, must truly fill. And now he is dominating the world as its prince and he is now the God of this age. People, when they serve any other God, they serve Satan. Satan has them on, in his control. This is what the Bible says. And what is Satan's objective? What does Satan want? Why is Satan deceiving all the people? John 10.10 10. Chapter 10 verse 10 tells us what he does. John chapter 10 verse 10 tells us To steal, to destroy. Mm -hmm. Amen. It tells us the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So this is what the thief does. This is what Satan does. Kill, uh, to steal, kill and destroy. This is his objective. How does he do it? How can he kill us? How can he destroy us? How can he uh, kill us completely? When we were with God, he was unable to do all of this. He could not steal from us because God was with us. He could not kill us. He could not destroy us. So how can he do it? He must first remove us from the presence of God. And how can he remove us from the presence of God? When we lose hold of the covenant, when we lose hold of the word of God, which equals sin, then he can take everything away from us. Then he can kill. Then he can steal. Then he can destroy. So that is Satan's objective. To take away the word of God, which is the covenant from us. If we look at Ephesians 6, uh, 10 to 20, it tells us he has a constant battle, even believers. Even against believers, he is constantly shooting at us attacks and flaming arrows in order to deceive us. This is Satan's stance. Satan is, is warring against us. He is the leader of an army that's against us the believers against those who are in Christ, the church of Christ. And he is attacking us constantly so that we may lose hold of the word. And that is why Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 to 20 tells us to put on the armor of God because there is a battle to be won. There is a battle that we must do, but we can only win it with the armor of God. And the armor of God is the gospel. Every part of the armor of God tells us about the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. More on this later, but, um, he, uh, but Satan also works in very different ways. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen tells us that he masquerades as an angel of light. And here, uh, the apostle is, is telling us it's not weird that Satan's servants appear good because Satan himself masquerades. He puts on a mask as an angel of light willing to deceive us. Not only does he deceive us softly, but also 1 Peter 5, 7 to 8 tells us resist the devil because he is like a roaring lion. And he's looking who to devour. So like a roaring lion, he attacks us, but with the cunning and the subtlety of, an, uh, of, a, of a deceiver masquerading as an angel of light. And he constantly attacks us. What is his purpose? What is the only thing that he wants to do? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is a key verse in understanding Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 4 tells us, So the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan only does one thing. Satan can give us um, 
can give us disease, can do this and that, can cause us trouble, but that is not his true objective. His true obje objective is this, to blind us so that we cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. In other words, if he takes Christ away from us, if he takes away the gospel from us, if we do not hold on to this gospel, Satan is willing to take it away. Satan's objective is to take away Christ from us because he knows that only in Christ, in Christ is everything. In Christ is our meaning with God. Within Christ we have true life. In Christ we have tr uh, all the solutions to this world. So everything that God has given us, all the uh, benefits, all the blessings that God gives us are in Christ, in that, uh, in that gospel. So if he takes away this gospel, he can take away everything. That is Satan's true objective. That is Satan's true attack. To take away the gospel of Christ. And to this day, he has succeeded. He has succeeded in taking away the gospel even from the churches. Because you see many churches doing this or that. And we saw this. He masquerades as an angel of light. He tries to give us good things. He things that seem good, things that seem reasonable, and then he takes away the gospel of Christ very subtly. And he tries to even deceive those who are chosen. Those who are chosen, even he tries to attack. This is Satan. And we must know Satan in order to resist him. One thing that I must tell you, not all miracles, not all supernatural things, not all good deeds come from God. Rather, we must remember Matthew 4. In Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert before starting his ministry. The devil uh, tempted it three times. First with the bread and the stones. Second with the cliff. Throw yourself from this place and, and, and then the angels will come and, and support you. But the third time, he says something very interesting. Let us look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If we look at verse uh, at verse eight, uh, Matthew four eight, and onwards, we see again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So Satan showed the kingdoms of the world, all the splendors, all the good things in the world. He showed them to Jesus and he said, I can give them to you. So the kingdoms of this world, the splendors of this world are in the hands of who? Of Satan. And Satan can give this to people. He knows every person very accurately and scrutinizes them. And he knows how to make each one fall. He knows if I can take away the money from this person, then he will lose Christ, then I will do it. And to other people, if I can give him money and then he will lose Christ, then I will give him money. If I can heal this person so that he will lose hold of the, co of the covenant, then I will heal this person so that he loses Christ. He can do many things, but his purpose is one, for us to lose hold of the covenant, to lose the word of God that talks to us about Christ. The word of God is Christ, and he wants us to lose hold of it. And he will employ any method, any strategy, any strategy in order for us to lose the word of God. This is Satan, as described by the Bible. A very fearsome adversary, a true enemy. And his objective is to steal away the word of God, because if he does that, we are under his control. So Satan is no plaything. Satan is not a being that we just say, oh, Satan, go away, and, and he goes away. No, he is a being that truly only fears the gospel, that Jesus is a Christ. Only in Christ can we defeat him. So this Satan, we must know him very closely. We must know his attacks. Satan causes sin. And because he causes sin, and when he, uh, when he brings sin to our life, then we are separated from God. So these three are the essential problems of mankind. And all of these appear in Genesis 3. First, 
the, uh, the, the serpent appears and he deceives mankind. He deceives both Adam and Eve. He tells them lies and that is his attack. Lying, deceiving. And what is his purpose? That we sin. And what is sin? Sinning is, holding, uh, uh, is losing hold of the Word of God. Sinning is truly leaving the Word of God. Sin is not believing in the Word of God. Sin is not knowing the Word of God. And then to lose the hold of the covenant. And sin brings death. Mm -hmm. Death is to be separated from God. And when we are separated from God, then we lose hold of everything. All the blessings in God, all of the identity that we have in God, as children of God, as kings of God, all of this is lost because we sin, because of Satan. So these three are the root of the fundamental problem. And we must understand these dip deeply. It's not just a, uh, a matter of saying, oh, Satan sin and separation from God. Rather, we must understand this deeply because these are the root of all problems in the world. This is the root of all problems in our society, in our world right now. And this is why God had to come. This is why God had to come in a body of flesh and to die for us and to resurrect this problem is so severe, so great, that God had to do all of that to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So we must know this deeply. Separation from God, sin, Satan. This, this three, these three are the root of all problems. And these are the problems that the Christ came to resolve. These are the problems that cause all problems. So if we organize this, because of Satan, we sin, and because of sin, we are separated from God. But these two are uh, causes of our separation from God. These three problems are deeply linked, but if we have to say which is the true problem, it's that we are separated from God. If we're with God, then sin is not, not a problem. If we're with God, then Satan is not a problem. But since all these two factors cause us to be separated from God, these problems are linked. These problems must be resolved. Satan, the influence of Satan must be resolved in our life before we meet God. The influence of sin must be resolved in our lives before we meet God. And if we meet God, then nothing else is a problem. So these three are the essence of the problem. Now, uh, we will pray in order to finish this lecture and we will continue on um, in just a moment. Let us pray. Yes, Father, you have allowed us at this morning to truly know the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. Lord, this is the gospel that all the early church preached. This is the gospel that you yourself have stated in the Bible that this is the reason of the Bible. This is why you gave us a Bible. Lord, allow us to know this deeply. Allow us to know the great identity and also the great blessing that you have given us originally. Lord, you have made us in your image. Lord, you have truly given us all blessings of kingship. You have given us all blessings of stewardship and all blessings of being your children, Lord, and having communion with you. And all of this was lost because of, Lord, we lost, lost hold of the covenant. And now all of the world is under Satan in the influence of sin. And even though we believe there are many problems, economic problems and political problems, many problems, Lord, but those are not the true problem. Mm -hmm. Lord, you said the true problem is being separated from you mm -hmm. because of sin, because of Satan. Allow us to know this deeply. Reveal this to us, Lord, not by knowledge, but by spirit. So that this is the answer that we may preach to all nations, Lord, that we may relate to all nations. Allow us to understand this deeply and allow us to understand the gospel as a result of these problems. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.